Hey friends, Petrina here with Homegrown Florida. It is a bit of a chilly and very wet day here in the Homegrown Florida garden, so it is really not a good day for gardening. And there is going to be a significant amount of rain in the forecast for the next few days. So I got to thinking, what do you do in the garden? <laughs> when you can't be out in the garden. I thought this would be a good time for reflection to see how our 2023 garden did this year, what goals we were able to accomplish, which ones we weren't able to. I think a lot of the times when we're gardening, we put these goals for ourselves and then, you know, we really only remember the ones that we didn't achieve. Like, I remember that my sweet potato harvest was less than what I would like, and I remember that I once again had another bad white potato year. But I forgot some of the really good things that happened, and a lot was very successful. So I think it is important to sit down every now and then, right before you're starting your spring planning is a great time, which is right now, and look back on what your goals were and what you were able to accomplish and what you maybe could learn from so that you can make changes and differences in the months to come. So let's start out with our goals. I write my goals in my planner at the beginning of every season and I usually do one planner per season. So the first goal that I had, which I have every single season, is to increase the amount of veggies that I'm growing in my garden um, to manage the needs of my household. The second one was filling a new bed and I did get this done very early in the season. I actually forgot that that was even this year. <laughs> my third one was switching from growing my garlic with synthetic fertilizer to trying to grow garlic with organic fertilizers. I am an organic gardener but there's two crops um, last year that I used a synthetic fertilizer on and that was corn and garlic. I felt like I just couldn't feed them enough. The fourth goal that I had was flowers. I wanted to grow more flowers. I never typically grew flowers. I don't think I ever grew flowers except for this last year and I thought to myself like oh yeah I had some great zinnias. I had a lot more flowers than just zinnias. <laughs> Number five was I wanted to expand my gardening to not just vegetables and fruits but also native plants. My sixth goal was to increase my fruit production. <laughs> Number seven was to increase my herb production. Now, I was growing a lot of herbs, but I wanted to grow more medicinal herbs. So the eighth goal I had was to improve my soil using more compost that I make here at home, cover cropping, mulching, all of those things. Um, number nine was I wanted to see how the garden would do when I abandoned it. If you guys watch the channel, you know I went on an RV trip for two months and I left the garden to fend for itself. <laughs> and then the tenth and last goal was expanding how I am preserving my food. So let's walk through each one of these goals in detail, look at what was successful, why it was successful, maybe what failed and what I think I'm gonna do differently next year to try to improve those situations. And then the, the big deal, which is gonna be at the end, is we're gonna talk about the goals for 2024. Now I think this is super, super important and you're going to see why throughout the life of this video why it's important to set goals and then look back and check up on them because when you set them you have more of a likelihood that you're going to achieve or at least make progress in those goals also those goals that i'm setting for 2024 are going to be the basis for my planning for my spring summer fall and even next winter's garden so all of these goals that I'm setting up are going to feed into those plans, which makes planning actually a lot easier. And it also makes, you know, maintaining the garden through the entire year a lot easier as well. So let's jump right into it. I usually select three to four goals each season. That's how I end up with about 10 goals. Sometimes they carry over season to season. And those goals are the first thing that I do when I'm drawing out how I want my garden to look for that particular season. Whatever the goal is, whether it's growing a year's supply of sweet potatoes or whether it's introducing more flowers into the garden, I start by placing those items first on the drawing of my garden. 
And then once you have them in their place with whatever they need, so if they need a trellis or if they need full sun, you place them in the particular beds that they are going to do the best at. And then you fill in the gaps, you know, everything else that you want to grow that's maybe not your top priority gets added to the list and gets added to your plan. When it comes to wanting to increase the amount of vegetables that I am producing to feed my family, I take it in a kind of a two approach phase. The first approach being that I want to grow a year supply of something that I know I can preserve in some way that will feed us for a year that we like to eat. And then the second way is growing enough food for that particular season that that plant grows in. Broccoli is my main example for that. Now broccoli doesn't grow in the summertime or anytime when it starts to heat up here in Florida. So this is one of those examples of something that I can't grow all year round. And I usually can't grow enough for the entire year because it has to be preserved in some method. Uh, it cannot be canned. The National Center for Home Food Preservation does not recommend broccoli to be canned because it is a low acid food and it would have to be pressure canned and by the time it's done pressure canning it would basically be complete mush. <laughs> Freezing is an option although it's not something that I particularly enjoy and I found that I probably am not going to eat it if it is frozen broccoli. So my only option now that I have a freeze dryer is I'm going to try to freeze dry it and see if I like it best that way. However the cool thing about broccoli is even after we take these center main heads off the plant while it is in season these plants will continue to grow and get bigger and bushier and as they grow and get bigger and bushier they are going to produce something called side shoots which are like little tiny florets and I have a feeling that the bags of broccoli in the grocery store with the florets must be side shoots because they're just perfect little florets of broccoli. Besides the broccoli, I do like to grow other brassicas like cauliflower, and this was the first year in 2023 that I was finally successful with growing Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are super difficult to grow here in Florida just because they are a very long season vegetable as well as a long season vegetable that likes cool weather. So friends down in South Florida may not have the best success with something like this, uh, but those in Central and North Florida are going to have a better you know, outcome. And my biggest suggestion with growing Brussels sprouts is the first one is the variety. I have found that Jade Cross works really well, although I want to try some other hybrids that have shorter time frames to grow, you know, days to harvest are shorter to see if that helps. But uh, the Jade Cross has really come through for me. It's really heat tolerant. It's, it hasn't mined the swing in temperatures and it, it does produce quite a bit of sprouts. I really enjoyed these. They tasted really amazing and I was just super happy to finally have grown Brussels sprouts here in Florida, which to me felt almost impossible for a while there. <laughs> carrots was another big one that I grew a little bit different this year than I have in the past. My carrots, I just literally broadcasted a bunch of seeds and let them grow without thinning them. And I know this is like a really big no-no out there in the gardening world that you should be thinning your carrots and I was honestly just trying to get rid of a bunch of seeds, some old seeds. Carrot seeds don't last as long as some others. So I had a bunch that I just needed to get rid of. So I just chucked them all into this bed and a bunch of carrots grew. <laughs> I was super pleased with that. Um, although I, I do think that I am going to do things a little bit different with my carrots this year. I am going to thin them. I feel like I wouldn't have had so many variation in size with my carrots had I thinned them just a little bit. Not like spending a lot of time doing it, just a little bit. Some other things that I like to grow was kohlrabi, which is another type of brassica. Kind of looks like a beet, but it's not. <laughs> It is a little weird alien shaped vegetable that tastes like a crunchy broccoli. Then we have the celery. This one was very similar to the Brussels sprouts because this is another one that's a long season that likes cool weather. And so not ideal for here in Florida, but it did do well and you can see that it was grown in shade. And it actually did really well for me grown in shade and it didn't bolt for a long time. In fact, after I harvested it here, it grew back and I got a second round. Now the second round did start to get a little bit on the, 
I don't know what you would call it. It's not bitter. It's a different kind of flavor, but it, it was a little off-putting. Radishes. This is, uh, I've grown radishes in the past, although I never really ate a lot of radishes. It's one of these examples of, you know, we grow stuff because we can. <laughs> but because of you guys, I figured out that there is a way that I like to eat radishes, and that is roasted radishes. And these daikon radishes roasted are absolutely outstanding. Um, I will continue to grow these guys in the garden. They do very well with very little input from me, which of course is one of my favorite things about a vegetable. <laughs> now let's talk about something that was a challenge for me this year and has been a challenge for a couple, oh, I guess it's two years now, and that is growing white potatoes. This was my harvest from spring, and it was a okay harvest. Um, I planted whole potatoes, and I averaged about three potatoes to the one that I planted. So really not the best ratio. <laughs> I got, you know, three times the amount of what I planted. When I know that there are people out there that can get six to ten times the amount of potatoes that they plant versus what they harvest. So not really a lot. And I did grow two different kinds. I grew Yukon Gold and I grew a Kennebec. The Kennebec was not great. It, it didn't store well. Storing potatoes here in Florida is kind of a little bit of an art because we do not have a place in our home that is ideal for storing uh, potatoes. You know, we don't have root cellars. We don't have basements. Um, the only place I know to store my potatoes is in a paper bag in the refrigerator. That's the only way that they will keep, but they do not keep for long that way. I, I think it's because of the humidity factor. That's one of the reasons why I put them in a paper bag, so that, that way it, it prolongs them. But they are only going to last a few months that way. It will be cool to try canning them. Uh, there's an herb potato recipe that I want to try that I'm really excited about. I think I'm going to do that as well as Maybe some scalloped potato dishes that then go into the freeze dryer. Either way, the first thing I need to do before I get into those awesome, cool recipes is, is actually grow them successfully <laughs> and grow a lot of them. So I'm planning on dedicating a bed to growing these, and I'm probably going to grow them in different places around the garden. And here's a few of the warm weather crops. I had a great cucumber year. I probably will not grow them this next year just because I have still so many cucumbers that are canned up, um, maybe just one or two plants for fresh eating. I had an amazing squash year. I grew a lot of butternut, um, burgress, buttercup. Um, I grew uh, seminal pumpkins. I grew um, trombuccino, lots of different squash. Corn, corn is another thing. The year before in 2022, I had a really great corn harvest. Uh, because I was using synthetic fertilizer, but this year I was trying the organic method like I did with the garlic. I'll tell you about in a little bit, and they this was probably the only corn that I got that was good. <laughs> All the rest of them were either tiny or, you know, they never fully pollinated. It just was a waste of a bed, which was unfortunate. Great pepper year, though. Really great pepper year. This is all sweet peppers, all different kinds. The Cubanellas kind of came in as number one. Um, I grew my own pimento peppers. I grew my own paprika peppers and made my own spices with those things. That was super cool. I have a, an entire year supply of peppers in the freezer right now. And, you know, they're still out there alive and probably will continue producing one of my favorite peppers that I grew this year was, I think it's called Lesia, um, Lesia. Really beautiful pepper, very, very sweet. I enjoyed that pepper a lot. If you're not into peppers, you're going to have to try that one, as long, uh, along with the pimentos, because those are super sweet too. Uh, Cubanellos, solid producers. Those are the ones that if you want a huge amount and you want to store a lot in the freezer, these guys will produce a lot, and they're a decent-sized pepper. And then, of course, we can't talk about warm season crops without talking about tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes. I had a great tomato year. I'm very pleased with how many tomatoes I was able to produce. Um, I do have, you know, this, this goal I, to grow bigger tomatoes. So I did get, you know, lots of currants, lots of grapes, lots of cherries, um, and a lot of these slicer tomatoes, but you know, I'm still on the hunt for a beef steak. So I have my eye on a few hybrids 
beefsteak hybrids that I'm hoping will do better this next spring. But I learned a lot through this process. Like number one, if you're going to do the uh, Florida weave method of holding up your plants, you really need strong support. <laughs> Mine, I had one side that was really strong and one that was not. And so you see a lot of bending over of the plants here didn't affect their production they still produced a ton which was fine with me but I am going to have to try some other ways to support tomatoes just to be able to grow these bigger ones and then our hot season crops come in and this is the sweet potato harvest I just put this video out not too long ago we got I think it was 25 pounds of sweet potatoes out of two beds and I hate, I don't even want to sound disappointed about that because that is awesome, right? 25 pounds is just about a full year supply of what we eat. We usually eat about 30 pounds of sweet potatoes. I think that that's mainly because we have not had white potatoes to be able to eat. So maybe if I can get white potatoes this spring, we, the 25 that we grew will be enough for us for the year. Um, but normally I get 30 pounds a bed and I did not get that this year. This summer felt like a really normal Florida hot summer. However, I would say that I feel like we got less rain and I'm wondering if that less rain contributed to the smaller amount of potatoes. I'm not 100% sure. I also had this situation in one of the beds where I bought slips because I wanted to grow the Haymond white potatoes to see if they would take the place of regular white potatoes. And by the way, they really do. They taste like white potatoes with a tiny hint of sweetness, but not much. <laughs> so they're great. But out of that bed, not only did I get Haymans, I got two other varieties, and I have no idea what those varieties were, but they did not do super well. So I believe that the slips that I got uh, contained other varieties other than just the Haymans. Um, since I have my own potatoes, the Haymans this year, I will produce my own slips, and I will make sure that uh, the beds that I put them in only have that particular variety of sweet potatoes so that way I can grow a lot more. Back to our squash, one of my prized possessions this last spring was my seminal pumpkins growing up my palm tree. <laughs> I thought it would be really cool to see if the tree would support them and if they would like it there because it's kind of shady and they adored it. I grew them all on that palm tree. I practiced, you know, kind of training it up the palm tree and it did amazing. I think I got a total of seven seminal pumpkins off of that one plant. And then here is the star, the winner of the garden for 2023, the Trombacino squash. Um, this is a summer or winter squash. I am growing one as a winter squash, so I'm going to let it ripen on the vine as long as possible. The rest of them I pulled off and used the summer squash. Number one, best summer squash, grows like a weed, bugs did not bother it, it, it did have squash vine borers all over it, didn't care, it just rerooted and kept going. Outstanding, I can't even say enough about that squash, you gotta try it. I had a few scallop patty pan squashes that I grew, and of course some of the Burgess um, buttercup squash, which is my favorite. They weren't overly productive, but they did well, so I was happy about that. And then one of my big wins this year, my mom got me a Arrow Garden Farm. And then I also had an Arrow Garden Harvest. And since then, I've also purchased two Arrow Garden Slims. I think they're Harvest Slims, um, where they're instead of like a six coupled together, they're a six in a line. These have really changed the way that I grow lettuce. I, have, I do grow lettuce outside during the winter only. But now I can grow lettuce year-round with these machines, these indoor hydroponic machines, which is amazing because we go through a lot of lettuce. And because they're indoor, they take so long to get bitter because they're, you know, in the climate controlled in our AC. So we have this never-ending supply of lettuce and I buy bulk seeds for these. And because you're using them in a hydroponic system, I mean, I get a 99% germination rate on these every single time. And the leaves and the lettuce are just outstanding. No bolting, no bitterness. I can't, I can't say enough about them.
Another goal that I had for 2023 was adding another raised bed. These are my eight by four foot raised beds. And I had some concerns with putting this raised bed in because I honestly didn't think there was enough sun in that spot. And I'm pleasantly surprised that there actually is enough sun in that spot to grow certain things. Some of those things that would grow well in a super shady area is going to be things like leafy greens, not fruiting crops, not things like tomatoes and cucumbers and squashes. I have tried them in there. They didn't do well. I've tried peas in there. I've tried beans in there. They did not do well at all either. It's really the leafy greens, which is great during the winter and the spring and the fall, but dead of summer, there's not a significant amount of leafy greens that you can grow, but thankfully the way that the sun moves through the sky during winter, this bed actually ends up getting more sun during the, I'm sorry, during the summer than it does in the winter. In the winter, it gets like three, four hours tops. But during the summer, it gets all the way up to about five, five and a half, maybe six hours of sun. So it it is one bed that I have to really strategize and think about how I'm going to grow and what I'm going to grow in there. Because, you know, like I said, during the winter, you can only grow crops that can handle shade. And during the summer, you can grow more things. But by the time that you have enough sun to grow those things, it is not a time when you can grow fruiting crops like tomatoes. Although, you know, now that I think about it, peppers would probably be a great addition to this bed during the dead of summer. To fill this bed, I used a lot of um, free materials like cardboard boxes on the bottom and then I used branches that had fallen from my tree out front. Uh, there's um, composted wood mulch from my county that they give away for free that we went and picked up by the truckloads. Uh, I did some compost on top that I did pay for and then I've been raking my leaves so that I can give it a nice thick mulch layer and that really did set this bed up for a lot of success. I did not experience uh, some of the fertilizer issues that I have in the past when I built beds like this. Um, I think it was the addition of that extra fertilizer that I had that I sprinkled down as well as the mulch layer that really helped. Now, when it comes to growing garlic, like I mentioned earlier, I grew garlic with a synthetic fertilizer back in 2022, but this year I really wanted to come off that because, you know, I really have heard of other people being able to grow garlic with just organic fertilizers, even though they are or tend to be kind of a heavy feeder. I have since learned that I was way overfeeding them with the synthetic fertilizer and that the organic fertilizer that I normally use on all my other vegetables and the processes that I use to feed the soil organically worked just fine and produced a great garlic harvest and this is how I did it. I started out with laying down an entire tumbler of compost. So it was finished compost. The entire tumbler I put in a half of a bed so a four by four square, and then I planted the cloves of garlic down into the compost about five inches. On top of that, I added garden tone or tomato tone, one of those. They're, you know, essentially the same. But I added some garden tone, and then they sprouted, and every couple of weeks I used some fish fertilizer on them until we reached around February. And once February came around, I pretty much laid down some bone meal and I stopped fertilizing. That was the last time. Um, and these were ready, I believe that they were harvested at the end of April or the beginning of May. And I ended up with about 35 heads of garlic. I was so excited. I grew three different varieties. It was Susanville's, Laura's Italian, and my tried and true Inchulum Red, which works every single year. The Susanville did not bulb up well. It did not vernalize well, even though these guys did get put in the refrigerator for 12 weeks before I planted them, which is essential for growing garlic down here in Florida because it just doesn't get cold enough for us. But the Susanville never bulbed up. The Lores did, but it split a lot. There was a lot of split cloves, and those will not hold in storage as long. Um, but I do use those for, you know, making minced 
garlic and oil and I freeze those in little ice cube trays or I dry or dehydrate them and I make a garlic powder. For the ones that were whole and not split, I hung those up until they were completely dry. I think this took about three weeks on my patio with the fans going the entire time. And then just because I wanted to try to be fancy, I braided the garlic and boy was it actually pretty easy to do. And not only was it easy to do, man, that is the way to store it inside your house because it just continued to keep drying and drying. And I never had a problem with any of them going soft or mushy or rotting. I will continue braiding my garlic um, from here on forward. It is not only pretty, but it is incredibly functional and um, perfect for soft neck garlic, not necessarily hard neck garlic. If you're a big fan of goals like I am, make sure to head down and give me a thumbs up that, that you like this video. Even if you're not into goals, but maybe you're going to try them for the first time this year, let me know that by giving me that thumbs up. Flowers was a goal for me that I kind of took on <laughs> haphazardly, <laughs> I think is the best way to put it. I knew it was going to be good for pollinating a lot of my vegetables because it would bring in more bees and things like that. What I didn't know was how much I would love it. I really was not into flowers. I mean, I like receiving them on special holidays and things like that, but I just never really understood, other than the fact that they're pretty. You know, I get it, they're pretty. But I never really thought that they would be functional. And I was so wrong. I was so wrong. Hear me out, guys. Learn from my mistakes. Flowers are important, and I know it seems concerning to you know, dedicate a space of your garden, that, that square foot or those few square feet to a flower that's not going to produce food. But it really, really did increase the pest activity and it increased the pollinator activity. And when I say pest, I'm talking about the good pests. And it did seem to attract the bad pests to the flowers and not necessarily to the vegetables. There was just, it was mind blowing the difference between growing flowers and not growing flowers. I grew everything from Mexican sunflowers to cosmos to chamomile for tea, a hibiscus out in the front garden, about every kind of color and shape of zinnias you can imagine. In fact, they took up an entire bed uh, growing above the sweet potatoes and I just thought they were so pretty and wild and the butterflies absolutely adored them. They fought each other. I also had a ton of different marigolds, calendula, which I use for a medicinal herb as well. I like to use it to make different kinds of creams and ointments and salves to help with you know, skin irritation or mosquito bites or scrapes and scratches. They're all really good for that. I did attempt straw flowers and they grew okay, not very well, and the germination rate was very, very poor, but um, they did do okay, and I did have one bouquet of those, but I had a ton and ton of bouquets of the different kinds of zinnias. Probably my favorite one is this pink one right here. It was small and it was delicate, but it was oh so beautiful. I also like the bright fuchsia colored one too. That one was really, really pretty, although the bright, bright red ones tended to grow more quickly and in more abundance than some of the other colors. I saved seed from every single one of these colors so that I can grow like a kaleidoscope of zinnias this next summer. I'm super excited. I had one echinacea that uh, germinated and sprouted and I was able to keep the plants alive. I have some bee balm, some sweet psyllium I think they're called. Then I had the butterfly pea which is great for teas. I love to grow cranberry hibiscus, not to be confused with roselle. You don't eat these flowers. I mean you could I guess but they're not as tasty as the roselles but they do make a beautiful flower. I even grew flowers inside my house. I grew petunias in my bathroom as like a natural air freshener and a great way to bring some of the outside world inside in my arrow garden harvest. One of the really cool things about growing flowers, like I mentioned, was the amount of insects that they draw. Right here is a swallowtail butterfly 
caterpillar that is living on some parsley. Here's a monarch butterfly. I had all kinds of um, swallowtails, zebra long wings, sulfur butterflies. I also had these really cool orange ones, which I think are gulf literaries. They are really, really pretty, and they really liked the native garden as well. So many different species of butterflies. I also saw an abundance of bees. I thought I didn't get bees in my areas. <laughs> Plant some flowers. They will come for sure. I had these little tiny guys, metallic little bees. I had these black and white bees. They were like striped bees. They were really interesting. Now that's not to say that I had complete success with flowers because the Believe it or not, after seeing all these beautiful flowers, this is probably only 25% of the seeds that I actually started. So there was 75% of seeds that I started that either didn't germinate or they didn't make it past the seedling stage of different varieties of flowers. So I'm definitely gonna be trying all of those again to see if I can improve. I got a ton of bees around my sunflowers along with lots of other pests, unfortunately, but they had some really beautiful blooms and it really attracted all the different kind of um, flying insects to these sunflowers. These are the mammoth sunflower that you use to harvest for seeds, for sunflower seed. And I actually did go through that process of harvesting the seeds of the sunflowers, of those mammoth sunflowers. I broke them down and... Um, took them out of their shell, which was a long, long process. I don't recommend it. <laughs> if you want to, go for it. But man, that was a, that was a labor of love. <laughs> Once you've separated them from the hulls of the shell, you have the seeds left and you kind of mix that with a little bit of brown sugar, a little bit of oil, a little bit of salt to create sunflower butter. Very much like peanut butter. I really enjoyed it. A little bit of a weird color. It's more of a gray color than it is like a brown color that you're used to with peanut butter. But flavor-wise, it is outstanding. And just another reason why growing flowers is such a benefit is you can do so many things with them, much more than I thought you could. The thing that had another really big impact in my garden was the native garden that I put in. You know, I've never been a huge fan fan of the way that Florida native plants look, or at least the ones that I knew about at the time. And so I always just thought, ah, oh, you know, I know it's good for wildlife. I know it's good for the garden. I know it's good for pollinators, but you know, is it pretty? Is it neat and tidy? Which is, as Jacqueline will say, I like to keep my crazy in a box. <laughs> and so I want it to be neat and tidy. And I just didn't think that natives could be. Thankfully, my friend Jacqueline came over and really just gave me a great consultation all about natives, and I've learned so much. The thing that I learned from the flowers was that, you know, adding all this diversity really does help your garden in, in ways that you won't even recognize until they're actually in. Well, a native garden kind of puts that at the next level. I would even say that a native is even more important than actually growing flowers. And you guys now know how much I love growing flowers. <laughs> I will forever keep native plants in my landscape. Probably the number one reason, they are just about the easiest thing to grow. And that makes sense because they're native. They don't need anything special from us. I don't feed them. I don't weed them. I don't water them. I mean, the only thing I do to them is I prune them because I want them to look a certain way. That's it, you don't even have to do that. They'll live fine without that. <laughs> so I started my journey into the native flower world by visiting Wilcox Nursery. This is a local nursery. Well, I wouldn't say local, it's a little ways away from me. It's kind of close to Largo, St. Pete area. While I was in the area, I stopped in and I took a look at all their native plants. They have a whole section. I kind of fell in love with it because you know it just made it easier when you're shopping for native plants it can be actually really hard because a lot of the there's a lot of the names of the native plants have non-native varieties or ones that grow in other areas or something like that so sometimes it's hard to find the true native plant Wilcox made it really easy for me. They put them all in the same place. You could just pick any of them that you see and they have little pictures of what they're gonna look like when they're full grown. It was a great experience. So I went and I bought a bunch of stuff. 
Now, I would not recommend this. I would not recommend getting a bunch of stuff that you like before knowing where to place it, which was my problem. Uh, Jacqueline over at the Wild Floridian came over to the house, um, kind of inspected all my areas, and we kind of figured out that maybe not all the plants I picked were good for my front yard because my front yard is very, very shady because I have this giant camper tree in the front yard that casts a significant amount of shade. It's also the north side of my house, so some of the ones that I picked were full sun plants. Thankfully, after putting them in, a lot of them have done quite well. They do stretch a little bit <laughs> towards the sun, um, but for the most part, they all look very, very good. This little guy right here is a fire bush. I know for a fact it's the native version because Jacqueline actually snatched that little guy right up out of her yard. Yes, that is right. She actually reached down to the ground and ripped it up rather aggressively. <laughs> and then we stuck it in a pot and I brought it home and it kind of looked a little sad the first couple days. And then it just took off and it is huge now. I was shocked at how durable these plants are and how big they get so quickly. You see right there, that little thing's maybe like three you know, four inches tall. Now it's about four feet tall and that's not even a full year. So Jacqueline came by and she was a great sport. She actually helped me pull out some of this um, landscaping that came with the house uh, so that we could put down a bunch of natives. And we started out with these guys right here. These are blanket flowers. They recently have indicated that blanket flowers are not technically native. They are still considered Florida friendly, particularly, especially this, this variety right here, but they are no longer deemed native um, for us. I liked them. Uh, they got crazy wild. I mean, they start off so tiny that you don't think that they're going to get that big and then they get huge and they got really crazy, really wild. <laughs> Definitely something the wild Floridian would love. For me, a little too much. Uh, I've cut them back numerous times and um, they keep growing back. So I might pick something else for that area. Now the winners that I really loved was the Stokes Aster, which are these plants right here. And as they got bigger, the blooms are so pretty. They are like this purplish pink, um, I don't even know, star-like bloom. They come and they stick straight up out of the ground. When they're not blooming, they have a nice little bushy habit of uh, like a grassy look to them. Uh, I really, really like those plants. Here's a fire bush after, I don't know, maybe a couple months. You can see it's gotten quite a bit bigger. Now after, you know, several months, it is, like I said, three feet tall. It's, it's much, much larger. It's gonna take up that whole area. I still had some plants that we didn't put in the front because of space or sun requirements. So I thought, you know what, let's find a spot in the back, get them closer to the garden. And so I designated this little area by my pool deck. We dug it out, we pulled the grass out, we um, put down some wood chips and we put uh, a border on there using some pavers. And here I am just organizing how I want them to look. And, and Jacqueline gave me a lot of ideas of how big these plants are going to get, what their growth habit's going to be. So I wanted to organize them in a way so that they're not going to, you know, overshadow each other or choke each other out. So once I have them organized, I put them all in the ground and they looked so cute and organized and neat and beautiful. And I was very, very pleased with that. And then they started growing and they got big. I mean big. It is taking up this entire spot. It is gorgeous. I am so pleased with it. It's almost like a little oasis of yellow, white, and black flowers. It's really, really pretty. There is um, this guy right here, which is a starry rosin weed. There's coreopsis. There's uh, milkweed. I think it's the swamp milkweed, which is pink, although mine never bloomed because the monarchs in my area were very, very hungry. <laughs> so mine never actually bloomed, so I never saw the pink flowers. Um, I also have in here the salt and pepper, which is that center plant right there. This one gets huge and attracts a ton, ton of pollinators at any given time. That one has bees on it all the time. I also wanted to try out a couple other things like uh, coral, honeysuckle, and uh, corky stem passion vine. But these guys are 
vining plants. And I didn't want to dedicate my trellis to them because that is for growing food. So I dedicated a couple of these half barrel pots along with these obelisks that I really, really liked um, so that they could grow up them. And they have been doing very well in those pots. They don't need anything. Like I said, I haven't even watered these pots. They just hold water really well with the soil. And um, in fact, the corky stem passion vine that's growing closer to the fence, uh, that one has grown through the holes in the bottom of the pot down into the Florida native soil. And it is doing great. When I came back from my trip, this vine had grown up all the way to the top of the obelisk and grew up the trees in my neighbor's yard. <laughs> Here is the milkweed with some of the uh, monarchs on them. Immediately upon putting these six plants in, they had aphids right away. <laughs> they had milk bugs, milk bugs right away. And they had monarch caterpillars immediately. And every single time that they started to grow back leaves, more monarch caterpillars came. More. I mean, I probably had 20 uh, caterpillars all the time, every single month, at different stages of their life cycle. Every time that these milkweeds got chewed down like they are now, they immediately grew back and they got chewed down again. <laughs> then I got to watch a bunch of the monarchs hatch and fly away, which was, I mean, amazing for me. It was, it was probably the coolest thing I've ever seen in my garden and I absolutely love it. Another big thing that I wanted to do was increase my fruit production. So I've got like 70% of the vegetables that we have that we eat are coming from the garden, which is amazing, but very, very small percentage of fruit is coming from our garden and we do eat a lot of fruit. Fruit is a challenge because fruit must be started now and you may not see the benefit four years but the longer that you wait to put those fruit trees in the longer it's going to be before you see those benefits the other challenging thing with fruit is that you could go through all that exercise of putting in and taking care of it and letting it grow for three years to find out you had the wrong variety or it got you know some kind of fungal issue or some pest completely killed it it is heartbreaking <laughs> heartbreaking but i had to get over that because i knew i wanted to increase our fruit production. So I had to get over those fears and I just had to plant. There is a saying that says the best time to plant a tree is yesterday and the second best time is today. And there's, there's, that's the best saying ever and I now fully appreciate it. So the first stop in my fruit growing journey was to a bunch of different nurseries. And here I'm looking at trees at the local big box stores. I'm not really pleased with their selection. You know, they have some of the generic stuff, lots of citrus. I personally am not doing any more citrus because I have had citrus in the past and it did get citrus screening disease. It's almost impossible not to have it. And then they had some figs and they had a few mulberries and such. But what I ended up doing was going over to Green Dreams, a Florida friendly fruit tree and plant place here in Spring Hill where I live. They are really cool because they ship all of their trees and their plants all throughout Florida. So even though you may not live near me, you can definitely still order from them and they'll ship it to you. I've gotten a number of plants from Pete over at Green Dreams and all of them have done well. I have not had a single one that was a problem. All of them are very large they're very healthy they're pruned nicely i i absolutely love them so we started out and we got a bunch of stuff <laughs> i just went kind of nuts over there and we got two plum trees we got a pomegranate we got a loquat we got two mulberries an elderberry a vitex a jabba de cava a sweet almond which is not a fruit tree by the way you think it's an almond, it's not. <laughs> it's it's uh, for flowering scents. But we got all of those. I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple here. Uh, but we, we went and we picked all those up. We created some space here in the yard, uh, creating a small mini orchard. 
my intention was always to grow these as small fruit trees. Uh, there is a book called Grow a Little Fruit, fruit Tree that I think is really, really great if you have a small property. I do not have a large property. I'm not like acres or anything like that. I think what I have is a little less than half an acre and a large portion of that is taken up by the pool. So I have a very small property and these trees are exactly 12 feet apart from each other, which is the minimum that you can do. And since I'm going to be growing these as mini fruit trees, um, based on that grow a little fruit tree methodology of keeping the trees small, uh, I felt comfortable growing my trees first off this close to the house and this close to each other. Now, I plant my fruit trees a little different than maybe some other people do, and I, I've heard a lot of feedback about this. I like to put some black cow into the hole because we have super, super sandy soil, as most of Florida does. Then I like to water that in twice and it drains within 15 minutes. It's not like up north where it's going to take, you know, hours or days to drain. Here it's like 15 minutes and that, that whole hole had drained. So I wanted to make sure there was enough water underneath the root ball to keep it uh, wet for the time as it establishes. And then I place it in the ground with the root structure sticking up maybe about two inches. Um, only because as it settles, that tree will shrink a little bit and you don't want it to be sitting below uh, ground level. You want it sitting a little tiny, tiny bit above or at ground level. And you see here, these trees are not 12 feet apart. These are mulberries and I talked to Pete about this and he had said that mulberries, you can grow them within two or three feet of each other as long as they have distance from other trees. So these are being uh, kind of tested to see how they grow sitting right next to each other and they have done absolutely fine. I added pavers around each one of the trees and I put them uh, mulch on top of them. I use a cedar mulch on top of them. All of these trees took off. I've even had to uh, prune them a little bit during the summer because they were getting really, really tall and I wanted to maintain that height. That is my goal here. And they just, they did spectacular. Here is Peachy the Peach Tree. <laughs> if you've been watching my channel, this is the one fruit tree that I have had for years. I've had Peachy for, I think it, she's going on, I think she's going on six years old. This is the start of spring and this is how peach trees start. They will actually flower before you see them actually add leaves, which I think is really neat. Once the flowers have come in, you'll start to see, and they've pollinated, you'll see the fruit coming. And these are the tiny little fruits that they originally start. They're really, really small. And this is the point where I start thinning them. It's important to thin them uh, mainly for the health of the tree and also to make sure that you get really good peaches. If I were to leave them on here, this close together, those three that close together, they would probably produce super tiny peaches and peachy is a variety of peach tree that is a smaller peach she is not going to have a peach the size of like georgia peaches if you're used to those she has smaller baseball size peaches versus the softball size peaches so i thin her um, towards the middle of spring just to make sure that she has um, you know, the best opportunity to grow those peaches well and that, you know, the heaviness of the peaches don't break her branches. This is after I've thinned them. I try to keep, you know, at least four to six inches between each peach and they are growing and they're starting to change colors, which is really cool. You can see there as we're progressing through the season, the peaches are getting bigger, they're getting more peach colored. <laughs> And now we're at a point where it's time to pick them. And you can see, well, hopefully you can be able to see there that they are not super big. They fit in, you know, the palm of my hand. But they are really, really good peaches. I thought they were freestone peaches, but after using them and trying to can with them, I realized that they're a cling stone peach, which means that the stone in the center does not disattach from the fruit very easily, which makes it very hard to can. And in fact, we did do one jar. That's the best I could do before becoming extremely frustrated trying to separate the stone from the peach. And we actually didn't like canned peaches, um, but I am really excited to try freeze dry them. I think that one is probably gonna be where we like them because we get a lot of peaches. This year, 
after all was said and done, after all the pruning, after all the thinning of the peaches, we had some that we lost to bug damage, worms specifically. We ended up with, I believe, 75 peaches, which is awesome. And the way my husband eats peaches, he could definitely eat all 75 without a problem within a couple weeks. And the peaches are great on the counter or in the refrigerator for that period of time. They, they don't go bad as fast as like grocery store peaches. I always pick mine when they're a little bit on the hard side just because I'm trying to beat the squirrels. <laughs> I could see the squirrels eyeing them and normally what will happen is um, as I've grown them, I've noticed that the squirrels will start to take little bites out of some of them to see if they're ready. Once I see that happening, I pull all the fruit from the tree. I don't give them an opportunity to keep eating them. <laughs> so as your peaches are starting to change color, you're going to want to be out there checking them. Another cool thing I did was I got a challenge from one of the viewers to grow a banana tree in a pot. And I think this came because I was talking about how I really wanted to grow bananas, but in the area that I'm at, we are just a little bit too cold sometimes in the winter. Not Yeah, like last, last year we got down to 26 degrees for two days straight. And that killed off most of the banana trees that you see around here. And my biggest concern is, is am I going to be growing bananas every year and then every winter before they have a chance to fruit, they are going to die down to the ground and never get fruit. That's my biggest concern. It's not a big deal that they die down to the ground because they do grow from pups in the ground. So they will create new bananas, but if I don't have a solid year of not getting frost temperatures, they're not going to produce bananas. They're going to keep dying back. So that was my big concern. And so uh, this gentleman had mentioned, hey, why don't you try growing it in a pot? And I thought, hmm, that's a good idea. I accept your challenge. And so I do have now bananas in pots. And I say bananas instead of banana because I did buy one banana, a dwarf cava. I can't say that word. Um, it's a dwarf one that I picked dwarf because I knew I was growing it in these, these big pots. But they have produced so many little pups coming out that I have been breaking those off and planting them in other pots. So I have a lot of bananas now. <laughs> I've actually stopped breaking them off and just started um, you know, cutting them down every time they start to grow. Mainly because I don't feel that the pot is large enough to handle more than one banana at a time. Besides a banana in the pot, I also have the Jabba de Cava. Now this is a very unique fruit tree and I was just so excited to have it. It takes a long time to grow and it takes an even longer time to fruit. I think when you're starting it from seed, it can be eight to 10 years. So that's an investment. So I bought a fully grown tree with a goal of um, asking for one that looks like it's gonna be fruiting within the next year or two. And this is the guy that I got, and it has done spectacular. This one likes much more acidic soil, so it is growing in nothing but peat moss and some fertilizer and a tiny bit of compost. That's it. It holds water really well. It is a tropical fruit, kind of like a grape. That's the best way I've been able to describe it. Besides the banana, the Jabba de Cabin, and all the trees we talked about, then I have all of my berry bushes. So this is a blackberry bush right here. It was one plant and they grow kind of similar to the banana in that it grows roots underground that pop up. And I have now, I think three or four different blackberries that are growing at different spaces in that area. <laughs> they, just, they just pop up out of the ground and grow new plants. And I'm learning the best ways to prune those um, as I'm going. And so I'm going to be trying some new things. This one right here is a mulberry. These were the mulberry trees and they actually produced within just a couple months of putting them in the ground. They were already producing. I have strawberries. I'm trying to grow strawberries in my green stock and it is finally, finally successful. Um, I'm in love with how this tower looks. The big test is going to be whether or not these guys can parentalize in the green stalks. That is my goal is to keep them as, you know, two, three, four year plants versus, you know, having to replace the plants every year. I don't keep them as annuals. So we'll see how that goes. You'll just have to 
follow along with me to see our harvest as well as to see if I can get these to perennialize through summer. Next up, I have Cado. <laughs> yes, I name all my fruit trees. Cado is a uh, day avocado. It's I picked the day avocado because it is a bit more cold tolerant. It looks a little different than the avocados that you see in the store. It's a little more pear-shaped looking rather than that round avocado, Haas avocado that you're uh, familiar with. Although I have not tried it yet, I'm told that it is very similar to a Haas avocado. It is a hybrid, from what I understand, a West Indies and Mexico, I think, hybrid. Another tree that I got this year was Oliver, or Ollie, the olive tree. <laughs> We did a naming contest, and uh, that was the name that had one of the highest number of votes, and I absolutely loved it. So little Oliver here, the olive tree, he's going to be a while before he produces olives, um, but I have him also in a pot. I could put him in the ground, but they get really, really big, and I wanted to make sure that I can control the size of this olive tree, and it is doing really well. I actually have this guy up front in my front landscape just because it's such a beautiful tree. Besides all the trees and bushes, I also grew watermelons this year, and this was a big deal for me because I have been growing watermelons for years, <laughs> years without any success, and I have gotten through all the challenges of bugs and disease and germinating the seeds, to the point now where it's, if I'm able to figure out when to harvest them. It, that has been probably the thing that I've struggled with the most over the last two years. This year, I got them to completion, some of them, and I had went in big. I used three of my raised beds in spring, which is a heavy investment for me to use three raised beds to grow watermelons, but I did. And it did pay off because I had a lot of opportunity to test and experiment. And my first couple watermelons that I pulled off were not ripe. They looked and appeared like they were ripe. They sounded like they were ripe when you knock into them. But as you see, my husband opening this one right here, clearly not a ripe watermelon. <laughs> so that gave me an opportunity to go, okay, that you know isn't ripe yet. I need to leave it on longer. You have to leave these things on so long that you're almost uncomfortable that they're overripe. And this one was closer. Uh, this is a, I believe this was a moon and stars. The last one was a crimson sweet, which is supposed to get a lot bigger than that. But this one was a moon and stars and it was closer to ripe. It tasted ripe, but it still did not, it was not fully ripe. This last one right here was the last one I harvested in the garden. This is a tender sweet orange. Uh, it's a yellowish orange inside watermelon. This one had finally was ripe. I picked the very last watermelon of the season correctly. And I now realize that it's kind of like when you're growing corn. Watermelon takes a long, long time to ripen. And it's hard to know when it's fully ripe. So if you think... Like you're, oh, I think it's ripe. Wait another two weeks. And if you're like, oh, I'm sure it's ripe. Wait one more week. <laughs> I'm telling you, wait until it's almost uncomfortable. <laughs> they all tasted really, really good. And I did find some big winners. I really liked the moon and stars. That one grew really, really well. The crimson sweet produced the earliest um, and I wasn't really a huge fan of the yellow-orange watermelons. They weren't quite as sweet. A surprise that happened was that in the watermelon patch, some cantaloupes came up that I did not plant. <laughs> so I don't even know where these came from, but they were outstanding. Oh my gosh, I've never had a cantaloupe that tasted this good. And they grew without any bug damage. They were really resilient to the fungal diseases that happened in my garden so I naturally saved the seeds and I am going to be growing a lot more of these this spring. I'm very excited about them. If you're not growing herbs in the garden, this is definitely one that you should try out. And I know lots of people say grow herbs and I originally thought to myself, I'm sharing all of these in Petrina's minds moment, <laughs> but um, I thought to myself, you know, what am I going to go out there and pick a couple you know, sprigs of basil or a couple sprigs of rosemary once or twice a year, you know, does it really 
make sense to give that much space to it. Well, the cool thing is, is that herbs don't really require that much space. You don't have to put them in the bed. I put them in a green stock. Almost all my herbs, not all, but almost all my herbs live in one green stock and they produce a ridiculous amount. But then I started to research, you know, everyone talks about growing herbs and how they're so easy and that they're so versatile and they're the best return on investment and all of those things are true. But how can I use them to their fullest potential? And that's when I started getting into herbal remedies or herbal medicinals, vitamins, nutrition, teas. And that's when I realized a whole new world opened up to me when it came to herbs. I grow about 30 different herbs in my garden, which sounds like a lot, but I grow a majority of them in a green stock, and a green stock can hold 30 plants. So believe it or not, you can grow 30 different herbs in one green stock, which I think is pretty cool, and that's what I got going on right here, along with a few other things. Um, I have oregano, basil, lemon balm, mint, marshmallow, <laughs> parsley. Then I have things like pineapple sage. I have regular sage. And then I get more into my medicinals, like this is bee balm right here. Uh, other than bee balm, I also grow borage, calendula, and chamomile. All of these are really good medicinal plants. I have a whole video of 30 herbs that I grow. Um, if you want to check that video out next. Um, I also have a couple, you know, not so common ones like this Moringa tree right here, which is basically the tree of life. It is has so many different vitamins. I dehydrate it at a very low temperature and powder it up and you can put that in your food. You don't have to dry it out. You could actually eat it raw in salads. I like to dry it out. It kind of mutes the flavor a little bit because it is a little horseradishy, so a little spicy. I also like to make a lot of different tea blends. Uh, so I make, I use something sweet, usually like roselle, cranberry hibiscus, dried berries, uh, like the blackberries and the strawberries that I grow, uh, elderberries, all any kind of those dried. And then I usually add something like lemon balm or hibiscus, mint as a base to make up a large majority of the, the rest of the teas. And if I have extra, I will add some of the medicinal plants like the bee balm and the calendula to add more nutrition. This is another great opportunity to put that moringa in there as well. And then I just blend that up and I have some tea bags that I like to use um, that I put them in. I made a holiday tea that had rosemary and roselle. It was kind of like a cranberry rosemary tea. It's really good for like holiday season, a little bit of maple syrup with it. Oof, so good. <laughs> I also have gotten really into these medicinals. The one I'm making right now is a bee balm oxymel. So it's bee balm flowers with honey and vinegar, apple cider vinegar that you allow to ferment for, I think it was six weeks. And then you filter out the flowers and you put it in the fridge. And this is really good for if you have a cold or a flu or something like that. It really like helps coat the throat and make you kind of feel better. <laughs> I have calendula solve that I made here, really good for like skin treatments. So it's um, the flowers of the calendula are left in olive oil for six to 12 weeks so that they infuse the olive oil. You strain out the flowers and then you mix the olive oil infused bee balm with beeswax pellets. Then I usually like to add some sort of essential oil and one of my favorites is tea tree oil and that's um, what I use for my calendula salve. Although I think in the future I might add some lavender to it too because I think that would make it smell really good. And I just put them in these little tins, allow them to cool at room temperature and then they harden into um, a nice thick paste. Another one that I tried this year that I really, really liked, it's so pretty to do, is called a fire cider. And so it has a lot of different ingredients, but it has turmeric, ginger, onions, garlic, peppers, rosemary, cinnamon, and then some citrus, some oranges and some lemons. And then you add, you stuff all that into a jar and then you fill it the rest of the way with apple cider vinegar and you let that ferment for six weeks. And then after the six weeks, you pour off or filter out all of the fruit and the, the vegetables so that you're just left with the apple cider vinegar infused fire cider. And then from there, you can add honey to it to make it more palatable because it is a little 
a little strong, maybe a little spicy too, but when you're sick or if you're about to go on a trip and you want a little bit of an immune boost, that is what fire cider is good for. If you're enjoying this kind of look back type of video, looking back into the garden over the last year to see how it did, make sure to hit that subscribe so that you don't miss out on all of the updates of how all of these plants, trees, herbs, and everything are doing in the coming months and even years. Improving the soil has been a really big goal for me across my entire not just garden but the entire property we're trying to find ways to reduce our fertilizer use so it's not leaking down into the aquifer and instead we're building up healthy soil and i did that through a few different ways this year and believe it or not all of those ways were free well almost free <laughs> One of the ways was cover cropping, and I did have to buy the seeds for the cover crop, but thankfully cover crop seeding is very, very cheap. Other than that, everything I did in the garden to improve my soil was from stuff around our home. And it was either garbage or free. <laughs> Who can beat that, right? Probably the number one thing that I do for my garden soil is compost. And I take all kinds of stuff from inside the house. So these are paper towel rolls, toilet paper rolls, shredded paper, cardboard from my Amazon deliveries, leaves that I rake from the yard, grass clippings, food waste. So the cores of apples, the ends of the lettuce, the peels of the carrots, all of those things go into my compost tumblers here. And during the summer, they actually process much quicker than during the winter. In the winter, they kind of slow down because the bug activity is less. During the summer, they are really on point. <laughs> and so you just put all that stuff together. I do kind of a lazy composting method where I'm not like measuring out all of the browns and greens. I basically just fill it with a bunch of brown material. And then I start adding on my greens, which usually my greens are either grass clippings or the food waste. And then I just keep adding greens until it kind of gives off a little bit of a scent. And then once I get to that point, I add a little bit more browns, like some shredded paper, rotate it, and then I allow it to compost. And once I've filled one completely up, I don't add anything else to it and I start moving into the other one. And I allow that original one to break down. And once it's broken down, or at least partially broken down, that is what I go and put out into the garden. Cover cropping, I have done a little bit in the past, but this year I really got into cover cropping. And this is sun hemp, one of my favorites, although cowpeas is really good as well in there. It's really easily accessible. You can go to the store and get some black eyed peas, a huge bag of them, and just throw them out in the garden and they will create a cover crop. But I really like the sun hemp because you can cut it down, like here, what I'm doing, I cut it down and then I'll stop. Now this time I cut it completely to the ground because I was ready to be done with it. But it, throughout the season, I cut it a little bit to about four feet tall and then I take those layerings or those uh, clippings and I'll lay that in the bed as a mulch and it breaks down as what's called green manure. It adds such high nitrogen, especially the sun hemp has a really high nitrogen ratio. And I saw such an incredible result in the beds that I laid these in, as well as the beds that I grew the sun hemp in and left the roots in the ground. Another exercise that I did this year was um, I had some soil delivered because my beds had sunk considerably. The way that I fill my beds means that I put a lot of wood down into the bottom and over time that wood, you know, deteriorates, breaks down and it shrinks. And so my beds were only maybe halfway up so it was time for me to refill them so i did go to witwam organics organics and had them deliver some compost it's a compost soil mix and um, filled all the beds to the brim i think there was one bed that i couldn't fill because you know it's in use and then i cover the whole thing with either wood chips or very thick layers of leaves um, this is the best mulch to do during the winter and then grass clippings during the summer and yet another thing that I attempted this year is to compost in place in my containers using the same method that I do for my beds. So I use some, you know, dead twigs and branches, some, this is cowpea plant debris, some old soil from previous containers, and then I planted some tomatoes in these. And then I fill just the top like three or four inches with a good soil mix. 
and boy does that work <laughs> that really does help keep the nutrients in the container to where you're not have to fertilize it you know every single week like i was having to do with my other container tomatoes and these tomatoes have grown very beautifully they the roots have gotten down to the areas you know with the compost and with the branches and the plant debris and that stuff has broken down and i know it's broken down because they have sunk and that's a good way to know if the items in the bottom of the container have broken down. They'll sink. And what's cool about the sinking actually is that you can then add compost to the top. So as my compost is finishing, I'll add a couple layers to the top. Tomatoes are a great plant to do this with because they can be buried up through the stem. You, don't, you can't bury tomatoes too deeply. The next big thing that happened in the garden in 2023 was I abandoned it. I always, I've done this before. We've gone on long RV trips, two, three months, and I've left the garden before. I always have kind of treated it like what lives, lives. <laughs> what doesn't, doesn't. And I never really took it as an opportunity to learn from the process of abandoning a garden to see what works best. And it kind of led me to this epiphany of how to grow a garden where you're very hands off. And I think this is really gonna speak to those gardeners watching that, you know, have very busy lives. You have full-time jobs, you have families, you have kids, you have activities, you have, you know, extended family, you've got pets, you've got, I mean, I'm sure you've got a ton of things. And as much as we wanna be in the garden all day long, we can't always be in the garden that much. So how can we make sure that our plants are thriving even when we're neglecting them. And that's what this trip really taught me. There were a couple steps that went into this exercise that I did. So the first thing that I did, I knew that I was going in the fall in my trip. So I laid down the cover crop. So these were sun hemp and cow peas that I laid down in the beds. And about two to four weeks before I left, I cut them all down and pulled them all out. I also tore out all of the loofah that was all over the arch trellis cut down the sun hemp and put that into various beds. Then I amended the beds. I added bone meal, blood meal, kelp meal, and composted cow manure. For the beds where I was growing fruiting plants like the tomatoes and squash, I did the bone meal, the kelp meal, and the composted chicken manure. Sorry, not cow manure, chicken manure. In the, in the bed that I was going to be growing most of my greens, like my broccoli and my cauliflower, I used the blood meal only. Then when I left, I did two things. I transplanted a bunch of seedlings that I had started very early. I'm shocked that they did so well because these were started in August, which is a tough month to start greens. <laughs> um, and then I direct seeded. And the big lesson that I learned from this is spend your time up front, right? If you want to be able to neglect your garden, you're going to have to do a little bit of work up front. And that is going to be that cover cropping, that amending, and then that tearing out, and then starting transplants. Because when I direct seeded them and left, almost, I'd say 90% of the plants that were direct seeded did not come up. Because I wasn't there to like monitor the water and make sure that, you know, bugs weren't getting to it. But the transplants, about 90% of the transplants lived <laughs> very well, actually. And so I learned that if you do want to neglect your garden, if you do want to spend less time in it, for whatever reason, family, holidays, work, if you dedicate a strong weekend of getting things done and ready and, and transplanted, they will hold their own from there on out. I left for two months and while the plants were crazy and the weeds were insane <laughs> when I got back, everything was thriving and living that I had transplanted while everything that I direct seeded was not doing well. So just a lesson there for me was that when I am going to need some time to myself where I'm not going to be in the garden as often, direct seeding probably is not the option that I need to look towards. It was really nice to have a little bit of time away to go experience new things. We, we made a lot of campfires. We visited some farms while we were on the West Coast. It was really beautiful. I got my little fixes 
of uh, gardening through all of these farms. The Baker's Creek store that I visited. Had a great time. Missed my garden a lot. <laughs> but had a great time looking at other people's gardens and seeing, you know, that these big farms had some of the same problems that I do in my small backyard garden. Um, they had powdery mildew. They had squash bugs. You know, they had damage to their fruit. They had unripened fruit. Like, it, the stuff you see in the grocery store kind of makes you think that you're struggling or you're not doing well in your garden if your stuff doesn't look like the grocery store. But when you go out to a farm and you can actually see how they're growing it and their plants and the fruit that they're producing, it gives you a new idea and a, and a better understanding of what your garden should look like rather than, you know, these unrealistic expectations that you get from store bought veggies. Another fun thing was visiting Baker's Creek. The, it's not just a seed store. Oh my gosh, it was not just a seed store, although I did love the seed store. They have an entire flower garden in the center. They have an apothecary with a bunch of herbal medicinals and teas. They had a baking section with canned jarred goods, um, sourdough bread. We had their cinnamon roll, which was outstanding. We just had a really good time. And then when we got back from our trip, I showed you guys what it was like what the garden looked like when I got back. If you haven't watched that video, um, I'll make sure to put it in the description. But the garden was a bit of a mess. There was a lot of weeds, and it did take me about a week or two to get all of that under control again. It didn't choke out the plants that were there. It They all did really well. Um, as you can see here, I have that, that trombuccino squash that did outstanding, but I had to get it up and out because as the fruit was laying on the ground, there were bugs that were chewing it up. And so I needed to get it up and on the trellis so it could hang properly. Um, so there was a lot of work once I get back, but, uh, it didn't take very long to get all of that back under control. The last goal that I had for 2023 was to expand my preserving. And so... I, I've been preserving for a long time. I've been freezing, dehydrating, canning, I've done a little bit of fermenting, not my favorite, but I've, I've kind of, you know, dabbled in all of that. And there are some things that I've learned that I really, really like dehydrated or really, really like canned. But I found a lot of things that I don't like dehydrated, canned, or frozen. Um, so I'm wanting to introduce new and better ways of us to use the food that's coming in from the garden. Otherwise, it's just being wasteful. I want to make sure that we eat it, and not just that we eat it because we have it, but we eat it because we just love that recipe. That's a different level. You can be preserving just to preserve, and then you can eat it or make it into an ingredient in a recipe and hide it. <laughs> That's the best way to say it, I guess. But don't you really want to just enjoy your food? Well, this year has been a big push for me to enjoy the food that I'm harvesting, not just hide it so that I get the nutritional qualities. The first step in that journey was actually having a place to be able to put my canned goods. And my husband surprised me with this little build out of a pantry. I absolutely adore it. He put a stainless steel sink in there for me. He put some, I think these are oak shelves um, that he painted. They're, they're over an inch thick and he braced them to the studs of the wall. And I can fit a lot of jars on here. And so I was able to move them from my kitchen, which has them had them in various cupboards, right? So all of my canned goods were in various cupboards. And, you know, I was never using them appropriately because they were kind of all over the place. But having them in one place now really helps me to be able to use them in our day-to-day -day eating um, so that I don't forget that they are there. The other big thing that helped me with my canning journey, which was by accident, <laughs> was getting an electric pressure canner. And I know these are a little on the risque side <laughs> because... Um, you know, they haven't been approved by um, the USDA or the National Center for Home Food Preservation, although they don't typically approve canners for pressure canning anyway. Traditionalists like the manual canners that you put on the stove top. I had one of those. It was working great. I've had it for years. And then recently the top got sucked or stuck on and there was no way to get it off even after, you know, it had cooled down and everything. So 
we had to break it off. And in the process of breaking it off, of course, we damaged the uh, pressure canner. And so when I was looking at replacing that pressure canner, I looked at, hey, you know, do I get an electric one now um, instead of the stovetop one? And there were a couple reasons why I really liked that idea. It was very hands-off, kind of like an Instapot or a crock pot, which I loved. And the other reason is I have a glass top stove. And even though the pressure canner that I used, the Presto 23 quart, was okay for my stove, it always felt like at any day that thing was going to crack. So I really enjoy this electric pressure canner. I have seen some reviews from other folks who've done some um, testing of the canner. And I am straying away from thick sauces. So I don't typically can anything that's super thick anyway. I mean, the most thing that I can that is thick is my spaghetti sauce, but even that is fairly thin compared to uh, some of the testing that was done with thicker things um, on other channels. But because I had the electric pressure canner and because it is so, so easy to use, I found myself canning more than I did in the past. And what's funny is, is my old canner could hold a lot more jars but my new canner holds less jars, but it's easier to use. And I have canned way more things with the new canner. My shelves are completely full because it's just so simple. It's so easy to pull this thing out and get my stuff canned and, you know, go to the grocery store while it's canning and not be concerned about, you know, the pressure canner exploding in my kitchen. It, ha it really encouraged me to do more canning activities and more canning projects. Um, right here I did diced tomatoes and I really didn't think that I would use them and they are the first thing that I have used out of my pantry of all my tomato goods. I actually have none left so I'll definitely be doing more diced tomatoes. Out of the diced tomatoes I also did spaghetti sauce, I did chili, I did salsa, um, I even used the skins and the seeds that were left over in my food mill to make a tomato powder, which will replace my tomato paste needs. And that was just as simple as dehydrating the, the skins and seeds and then grinding them down into a powder. And then when you reconstitute the powder, you do a very, very small amount of liquid to reconstitute it and it creates that paste and that, that intense flavor. I'm using it in seasonings. I'm using it on everything. I mean, the stuff is addicting. The trick to not having it be bitter using the skins and the seeds is to dehydrate it at a very low temperature for a long period of time. So I dehydrate mine at 100 degrees for 24, I think it was, 24 hours, maybe a little bit more. And if that was not enough, filling all these shelves with canned goods, filling the freezer with freezer goods, I got a freeze dryer. This is my new toy and I am using it every other day at this point, basically. My first um, try with the freeze dryer was with strawberries and banana puree. So I had some frozen strawberries in the freezer. I also had some bananas in the freezer that I had already um, pureed down. And so I stuck all that in the freeze dryer and within 24 hours, the freeze dryer had completely removed all the moisture and I put them in mason jars and I don't even know why I vacuum sealed them because within about three days, all the strawberries were gone. <laughs> and the strawberry powder that I made and the banana powder that I made, that took only about a week before that was gone <laughs> into uh, smoothies. It is such addicting snacks. You have to be careful because you would not sit and eat this many strawberries, but man, you will sit and eat this many freeze-dried strawberries. <laughs> I could eat a whole pint of these things in one sitting. Other things that I was able to can this year was the Brussels sprouts. Like I mentioned, these were not my favorite, but I know a lot of people that really enjoy these maple balsamic pickled Brussels sprouts. I'm going to try them freeze dried this next year. Um, I also did a lot of broth, so chicken and beef, as well as turkey broth. I did a lot of tomato products. I did a ton of fruit products. The first time ever doing salsa verde um, from my tomatillo plants, and that is really, really good. I didn't know I'd like it as much as I did. I did chili for the first time, and that is outstanding. I've done different kinds of soups. 
uh, minestrone soups, my um, soup base, which is just a vegetable base, and sometimes I add chicken to it. I made cranberry juice for the first time this year. I made cranberry sauce, which I have made multiple years. I just really love canning all these different things that at the store have so many additional ingredients than what you need. So for example, this cranberry juice is just cranberries and water. I didn't even add sugar because I feel like I can always add my honey simple syrup later to sweeten it. I just want the whole product and then I can add whatever sweetener I want when I open the jar. So we've gone through all the goals, the successes, the failures, the learning opportunities. Let's talk about my, what the goals are for 2024. My first goal is to expand how much vegetables I'm producing for our food. I'm hoping to get from that 70% to 80%. And I think the way to do that is to grow a year's worth of food in the following areas. <laughs> white potatoes. I need, I need to win this battle <laughs> with these white potatoes. Peas and not sugar snap peas. I've grown a year supply of those before. We just don't eat them as much as we eat regular shelling peas. Onions, I've grown onions plenty of times before, but I've struggled with keeping the space that they're in unobstructed so that they get big. I've got to grow enough hot peppers. You guys are probably gonna laugh at me because I, I don't eat spicy food. There is a small amount of spice that we do add to our food. So I think if I grow peppers, hot peppers, I'm limiting them to growing just once every three years. And this is the year that I have to grow them because I'm completely out. And then I can harvest them, vacuum seal them, and freeze them. And usually that will get us through for two to three years. I know it sounds crazy to keep a vegetable in your freezer for that long. But usually somewhere around the midpoint, I pull them out and I dehydrate them. Well, this year, I think when I get to that midpoint, I'm going to pull them out and I'm going to freeze dry them. Or maybe I'll freeze dry them from the beginning. I don't know. We're going to test that together. But if I can grow enough to cover us for three years, that gives me a lot of benefits when it comes to growing hot peppers. I get the hot peppers for that little bit of spice that we need, but then I don't have to grow them for two years after that. And that's important because hot peppers and sweet peppers, they pollinate each other. And when they pollinate each other, the offspring of that seed will come out most likely hot. And I do not want to cross pollinate my sweet peppers. I want them to remain sweet. So I don't want hot peppers in the garden when I'm saving seeds. So this year I will not be saving pepper seeds because of that reason, because I'm gonna grow hot peppers. And then the other thing is I want to grow more roselle. Oh my gosh, my roselle season this year was tough. I've never had a problem growing it before. I'm going to revert back to the way that I grew them in the past, and I'm going to try to grow as much roselle as possible. I use it a crazy amount in teas especially. The next thing is I'm going to focus on our fruit production. Now I've gotten all the, the foundation down. Now we have to build the maintenance of these fruit trees and bushes. I have to start pruning them properly. Um, I do prune my peach tree the correct way, but I haven't shown that much focus and attention to some of the other ones. And now that I've got that foundation and I have these strong plants and they've made it through winter, I want to really treat them very thoughtfully in the way that I am pruning them, the way that I am feeding them, to ensure that they live very healthy, happy, and productive lives. I want to increase the amount of experimentation I do in the garden, especially when it comes to the green stalks. Um, I'm growing strawberries and they're actually working. That's never happened to me before. I want to grow, you know, warm season crops in the green stock when it's cold and I want to grow cold season crops in the green stocks when it's warm. I want to learn how to extend my season using the green stocks and using shade and covers and things like that to see if I can extend my seasoning. So we're going to be doing a lot of different experiments and hopefully the experiment with the banana plant this year will show whether or not it's possible to grow bananas in a pot and actually get bananas from them. I'm going to be growing a bunch of new types of flowers. These are going to be what I call 
more difficult flowers. These are, for the most part, perennials. And they are, some of them are from bulbs and not from seed. And some of them are more difficult and some of them are less traditional, maybe a more rare. I'm very interested in seeing if I can finally learn the trick to starting these plants from bulbs and seeds. It has been a challenge for me. It's a different ball game when it comes to flowers and when it comes to vegetables. So I am learning. I'm learning through trial and error. I'm learning through research. Um, the next way is preserving. This is an extension of the 2023. So I have found better ways to preserve my food so that I like to eat it. Now I wanna get a lot more inventive. I wanna do mixes. So when I'm canning beans, I don't just wanna can beans. I wanna can baked beans. When I'm canning um, chicken, I don't wanna just can chicken. I wanna can salsa verde chicken for enchiladas. A lot more things that are more complete meals rather than ingredients. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I also want to do a lot more of jams and jellies and um, juices that are, you know, more different. Not just your standard strawberry, you know, but um, I think I saw a plum sauce that I thought would be really cool. So I want to start getting into more of these combinations for canning as well as making full meals in the freeze dryer. So making a lasagna, cutting it into small pieces and putting it in the freeze dryer to make a actual whole complete meal that is freeze dried and can last for years. That would be crazy for me. And then the last goal I have for this year is more medicinals. So I just dabbled in that in 2023, but in 2024, I really, really want to get into doing stuff that I use on a regular basis. Cough drops, uh, gummy vitamins, syrups, more teas. I'm addicted to teas. I want to make soaps and I want to make a mosquito repellent that actually works. I, that is going to be a challenge. <laughs> that is a big goal because there's a ton of mosquito repellents. I'm not sure that all of them work as well as, you know, we hope. And so my goal is to try to make these to where not only do they look good, I can grow them, I can produce them in a pretty way, but that they're actually effective. <laughs> so those are my goals for 2024. Um, I would love to hear what your goals are for 2024, so head down to the comments and leave me a note on what your biggest number one goal for your garden is going to be this year. I hope you had fun hanging out with me today, just kind of taking a look back at, you know, what the garden did and celebrating the successes and taking time to learn from the things that didn't work out so well. Happy gardening, guys. Mm -hmm.